our last two lessons, we talked about a few basic aspects of music that are grounded in psychology. Patterns, progressions, punctuation, and perceptual hierarchy. Today we'll go further, looking at an important aspect of musical contrast, salience. We've already mentioned that human perception has evolved to favor priorities. The actual criteria for what stands out in a given context can get quite complex, but normally the result is a hierarchy. And this is also true of successive musical moments. Not all musical events are equal in salience. This is essential for a composer to understand, since composers who get this wrong can seriously misjudge the effect of their pieces, leading to the kind of chaotic or tepid results that no serious composer wants. In Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, he mentions an experiment showing that during, say, a colonoscopy, not all the moments in time are remembered equally clearly. In particular, the framing moments, the beginning and the end, as well as the extreme moments, peaks, stand out in our memory much more clearly than the durational details of the whole experience. We'll talk about musical framing in more depth in a future lesson, but the point here is that, in the same way, certain moments are normally more salient than others during the musical flow. One common psychological trick to heighten salience is everywhere in evidence in everyday life, as well as in music. Contrast effects. Contrast effects are moments when something stands out by virtue of being different from what surrounds it. This is true of visual art, as in music. In a painting using mainly light beige colors, a little patch of dark brown will stick out much more than the same brown spot in a landscape where there are already many shades of brown. Similarly, in music, if you've just heard a phrase in the winds, following it with strings will stand out more than if the strings had been there all the time. Here's an example. Now here's the same example, but the accompaniment for the first phrase in the winds instead of the strings. This makes the arrival of the strings more distinctive. Both versions create contrasts, but the effect is stronger in the second version. This is because we're very quick to notice norms in our environment. Once something becomes normal, even temporarily, changes stand out more. This suggests a very important principle in planning musical forms. Plan the contrasts. And this also implies planning what you will not do. It's important to notice that many of the most important contrast effects are not primarily matters of pitch. For example, what creates the salient moment here? None of the pitches in the second bar are new. They've all been heard before. Here the contrast comes from the rhythm, subtly four times as fast. There's also a very salient change of texture as well, passing from homophonic to monophonic. And finally, the dynamics go suddenly from forte to piano. Now imagine if the first texture went on longer, say 20 bars, in chorale style. The change of rhythm would be even more striking. It could even sound like a mistake if not followed up appropriately. Here's another example. Here the first phrase is played by strings and woodwind together, and the second phrase is woodwind alone. Let's compare it with this version, where the strings are alone in the first phrase. Now, since there are no woodwinds in the first phrase, the contrast between phrases is more vivid. Another example.
Here the orchestration is constant, flute and pizzicato. The change here is just rhythmic. The flute line gets a lot slower starting in the third bar. Now I've rearranged the same example with only strings in the first two bars. As we'd expect, the flute's entrance stands out more. And I could make it stand out still more if, for example, I added octaves to the pizzicato bass in the third bar. These examples show us how one of the most important ways to highlight a contrast is to make it arrive after a fairly stable passage, which does not include whatever is going to provide the contrast. So, if you're planning the arrival of an important new musical idea, you should plan ahead so whatever is most distinctive about it isn't already present in the music right before. These examples also serve to reinforce another principle that we've already mentioned, degrees of contrast. What I'm doing in these examples is playing with degrees of contrast. This is an essential technique for the composer to master, since it allows us to fine-tune the musical context, directing the listener's attention to important moments. To sum up, we've looked here at ways to make a contrast more prominent by planning in advance to emphasize contrast effects, as well as at ways to adjust the degree of contrast by changing or not changing more than one dimensional music at the same time. These things are rarely discussed in composition teaching, but they're essential for really effective composition.